close from regretting the GDP of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, plus, if, if you've got a million people all making the same wrong investment decisions, then it makes what happened last year to lean into the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this might be a reason you don't want everybody to use uh, the, the, uh, all the copies of a particular lawyer. Uh, so a lot of interesting things are going to happen here. Robin Hans has developed some of these ideas, but a lot of them are very interesting and very unsettling. So that's why I'm very interested in figuring out how far away are we, because it's a kind of a uh, countdown. We don't know where superintelligence might occur, but at least we know this is a way towards, well, if not superintelligence, at least a lot of intelligence. I, I was just wondering about whether you'd give them the vote. I mean, and I mean, and don't answer with only after they've been in existence for 18 years. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, but I mean, that would be shit. Uh, from a practical perspective, the first upload is likely to be a cryonics patient who uh, added something to his contract, uh, volunteering for this, and that would mean that uh, legally he would not be a person; he would be software at first. But in the ideal scenario, of course, he would immediately go on CNN and say, oh, I haven't got voting rights, but I cry like you, virtually, and so on. So every, and in this ideal case, everybody would realize, oh, this poor virtual man, let's make sure that he gets voting rights. That's still going to take a few years. Uh, that's the ideal scenario. So despite all these complications, you don't seem to be afraid of this future. You seem to be looking forward to it quite enthusiastically. I, I think so. Uh, I think at least... The, the, I think we have a better idea about its weirdness than a pure uh, superintelligence based on some kind of software, because that could be anything. So we're going to take one question from there, and maybe Suzanne can get ready to do the talk. And then we'll... Question? So, um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, just listening to all this, um, so how long do you think we see some real parliamentary reform and have the House of Uploads? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, I think uh, actually uh, it will be surprisingly quick when people see the need for it. I could imagine, for example, that uh, uh, if you get to the fast running upload economy, uh, within a year people have realized, oh, the, the, the normal system is too slow. We really need to get the house of uploads. Uh, then, of course, uh, you're going to get all the disputes about whether this uh, is a good idea uh, or not. But different countries are most likely going to solve it in very different ways. Uh, there is even some interesting pro problems. The ethics is quite intriguing. I'm working on a paper right now on it, and I realized even at this meeting that I, I'm in competition. There is another in the upload ethics paper coming out, so I better get to there first. And there are a lot of interesting problems because uh, normally when you invest in yourself, like uh, uh, getting healthier, that's a slight investment. Here you get the kind of ontological jump. Becoming an upload. Uh, might be relatively expensive and it might also mean a very drastic shift in, what, in one's existence. So there are various interests of uh, equality going on here. Uh, it's not clear whether the uploads are an, an, an upper class or lower class or kind of imaginary class. It, it might upset also a lot of interesting things about how a society should be organized. So it's obvious like a kind of infinite cookie jar for us philosophers because we're going to be having a lot of things to do about it. Besides, of course, we're sheer engineering. Yep. So while we get Suzanne's PC up, we get time for one, yeah. one more question. Uh, of all the people who have signed up for Gramex, who's going to want to be first to have their brain scanned? Surely <laughs> everybody wants to be about 10. Exactly. So I, I said that in my gonna, talk too. Yeah. Yeah. Make, is there somebody who's like, got a special clause in their contract there and knock off 10% of return for being first? Uh, I, I could imagine somebody doing that. I can even imagine some of, some of the people I've been talking to, they think it would be a tremendous advantage to be among the first uploads. I think we're completely wrong, but as a scientist, <laughs> I of course think that, well, having the wrong motivation, but being fully informed consent as a volunteer, mm, as a scientist I'm very happy to <laughs> wrong about that. I think most likely we're going to kind of demonstrate this on a cat long before and people are going to be pretty convinced it's working because the, the emulated cat is behaving just like the original cat did. Uh, but it's tricky, it's tricky and um, I'm certainly considering how I'm going to write it in my cryons content. I certainly want to be uploaded but not as a first. So that I can make the point that was made in the uh, summit <coughs> last weekend which wasn't very strongly explored, maybe it was in the workshops, we talked about <coughs> The concept of a self improvement does not need to begin with human level intelligence. It can begin with subhuman level intelligence. Yeah. So we could end up uploading a cat and having it recursively self improve to overtake us rather quickly. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, it's, uh, I find it rather unlikely that the cat would find it worth the effort. If the trans rats on the other hand, I think I would be keeping an eye on 
We can all read in half rats genetically quite a lot. Yeah. Okay, so many thanks to Anders. After four o'clock in the pub, or perhaps in the general discussion later on in the meeting, to follow these ideas, but to continue to give a flavour of some of the ideas that were discussed, uh, Dr. Suzanne Gildert, who is from the University of Birmingham, uh, was also at the conference and is going to give uh, some of the highlights that uh, she encountered. Hi. Um, so this is actually going to be quite a short talk. I just want to really get across one idea that I found to be quite. Um, close to my heart and quite moving at the Singularity Summit, which was the idea of how, um, well, massive online science collaboration can really help push um, us forward towards a singularity. So I decided to call this talk Massively Multiplayer Online Research Project Science. Um, and this is... Uh... Okay, so this is based on Michael Nielsen's talk, um, which probably will be online so you can all watch that. So um, basically there's a big problem in research science, which is there's very little communication between research groups uh, that are working in similar areas. So what you get happening a lot of the time in research work is duplicated. And this, this particular model of how, how science works is pretty outdated, I believe. And with all the communication and networking technologies and tools that we have today, I think that there could actually be quite a big revolution in the way that science is done. So really, this is kind of asking how can we address this problem. Um, can we bring small research groups which are at the moment competing for funding, can we bring them together and generate projects that would not be possible without these, um, without these online collaboration and communication tools that we have access to nowadays. So in, in Michael Nielsen's talk, he discussed two main ideas. And the first one is that open source principles might be able to be applied in the research community, which could enhance the progress of science. And the second um, point is that the potential of the general public can actually be tapped as a resource to help, to help scientific discovery by techniques known as crowdsourcing. And this is where you take um, a large group of people, a crowd, and you use um, a small amount of their knowledge, which doesn't have to be very expert knowledge, but you use that and you use the power of the crowd to actually, to actually make some advancement. And I'll explain that a little bit in a moment. So the first one is um, open source research for broad experts. And the, the kind of stereotypical example of this that's given is um, Tim Gower's maths blog, which was started as a fun project um, on a blog, which I put the link up there, and the idea was to come up with new advances in mathematics, looking for proofs to problems, and basically um, looking at mathematicians all around the world and seeing if they could contribute anything to an open source project. And this has actually been extremely um, popular. There were one problem was put up on this blog, and there were 30, uh, there were 27 contributors, and over. 37 days, they actually managed to solve the problem of this, um, of this pro proving a new, a new concept. And I won't go into what the concept was, you can read up about it on the blog. So the problem was solved and the write-up is actually underway. And what uh, Michael Nielsen said about this is it is to normal research as driving is to pushing a car. So that really gives you an idea of, of what the potential and power is for this. So it's a new kind of exponential speed up. It's yes, getting more yes. people involved in yeah. solving an individual yeah. problem. It's a way of getting people together and using their, their power as a community to make more of a difference than just the multiple of the individual people working on their own. So the second uh, point was um, harnessing this idea of crowdsourcing for scientific discovery. And again, the example I'm going to give of this is known as Galaxy Zoo, which is... Um, a very simple idea, but it works amazingly well. So there are telescopes which take automated pictures of all the galaxies in the sky. And there is so much data that um, the scientists that are taking this data cannot look through all the galaxies and classify them themselves. And what you actually find is that a computer program to classify the galaxies doesn't work well enough either. So the way they tackled this problem is that they put the idea online and they said, OK, amateur astronomers, come forward. Um, play about with this, you know, they give them a little bit of training and then they classify galaxies and they just do it for fun. And what you find is that 
Over 100,000 people volunteered for this kind of project. They classified